Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-hmm
a mother gave me nine piano lessons, nine lessons on the organ. That was it. She made me learn the organ first. In fact, she made, she wanted all of us to learn the organ first, so that so I played the piano like I play an organ, really. <laughs> and we had we had an SD organ. Mother had this SD organ before she was married, and uh, Papa bought, bought her a Steinway. And so I was brought up on the very best organ and the very best piano that were made. <laughs> and uh, I, when I once learned um, the keyboard, well, I didn't have to take any more lessons. <laughs> you just had to practice and get on with it. <laughs> I kept on, I kept on playing things till they, they were so amazed. And uh, my sisters are very musical, also, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. Did you have? Did you? Was it a, a requirement, or did you have to sing in the church choir, or was that left up to whether you wanted to? That was or? left up to whether we wanted to or not. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But did you? And, but, but my oldest the sister, two years younger than I, has has the contralto voice. Well, both of them, both my sisters had the contralto rather than the high soprano, and uh, so I I had very high soprano, and uh, but this next younger sister and I sang duets from the time we were I was seven and she was five <laughs> well that was an education for uh -huh. itself and it? if we get whenever we get together now why she'll bring out some old duet we used to sing back years ago <laughs> Is it? and try to sing it <laughs> now your sister's still living oh. my oldest sister is uh, and both of my sisters um, joined the Episcopal Church when they were in college, uh, Roberta went to Albion, but my youngest sister, Eveline, went to um, um, Girls College in California, and that's where she met her husband. And my sister met her husband in, um, when she went to Boston, to mm -hmm. the University of Boston. And uh, she joined the Episcopal Church there, and my youngest sister joined the Episcopal Church in California. So they both, <laughs> and Papa was kind of, <laughs> kind of hurt <laughs> that he that she they never joined the Methodist Church. Uh -huh. but of course I bet uh, with uh, your family being so uh, talented in the music field and with voice, you had many good evenings at home. Um, no, it was always with other people. I see. Because they both taught mm -hmm. other people, and it would be either the choir, and my father always had a um, bunch of young people that had never had any direction, musical direction. Um, he had a 20-piece orchestra when I was about 10 or 11. Young uh, farm children that never had played with other people at all were interested in an instrument and he'd have them, he came, had them come to the parsonage and set up their instruments and it was, it was fun. The learning, those those young people, some of them uh, went on and were really good musicians after. I know, th I know two, uh, uh, two cornetists that went and became um, first cornet in the um, University of Michigan band, walking band. Yes. Two young men. Huh? What was your father and mother's name? Uh, Robert, Robert Chase. Robert Chase. It was my father. My mother was was uh, Mary Reside. Hmm. And how did she spell her name? R e s i d e. Uh huh. Her her grandfather came from Scotland in 1832 to Michigan. And my but my father's people came from from New York and Ohio mm -hmm. into Michigan mm -hmm. back in the 30s. So you just grew up and had a fine childhood and, mm. and happy memories. I imagine around Christmas time, a minister's family is very busy with all the church activities, yeah, yeah, getting yeah, ready. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, the parsonage that you lived in, are they like they are now? Did oh, they yes. furnish the parsonage? And no, no, we had our own furniture. We moved everything, books. Oh, my goodness, my father had boxes and boxes of books, and it always took two or three days to get moved, you know, because... No, we all had our, we had our own furniture. Just the, the building. Did you, as a child, mind moving about like that? No, because we, st we were, uh, really, there was only one place that I remember we were three years, maybe two places, were three years, 
then you see then after I, my children my after Elizabeth was born we went back into the parsonage mm -hmm. and stayed with them because I, I was always asking me to do so many things my husband was a registered pharmacist and he although we were only 15 miles from where he worked why well, he just he went back and forth with mm -hmm. the, with a little car we had Ford, I think. Was Ford. growing up and dating, was that any problem with Papa? Or were they strict no. disciplinarians with you? No, not at all. Um, he'd always encourage all the boys to, to um, take it only, that we were not allowed to have a boyfriend until we were 16. Mm -hmm. That was the one thing we could not go out on a date. But we had lots of children in. Mm -hmm. And we and there were things going on. And my father, uh, every uh, from the time I can remember, he supervised building a room onto the back of the church for young people's activities and he'd teach the boys to play basketball and uh, wrestle and things like that and the girls learn tennis in the mm -hmm. summertime so the, his church work was just his life right? yes both the mother and the father mm -hmm. were like that the mother of course with the music more and with art mm -hmm. she helped people with with the needlework mm -hmm. and so we were as a family, we <laughs> we were all so busy with other people, <laughs> really. So you grow up. Uh, you grew up with. I grew up helping other uh, people. Helping other people. Now you got you married and had three children of your own, uh, and you mentioned your husband was a pharmacist. Mm -hmm. What was his name? Lawrence McKenna. And how he was from Lexington, Kentucky, and after the war, came to up. Uh, to uh, World War One. World World War One. He was in that and overseas, and and but he wasn't really injured. He was a he was an assistant to. Uh, he went in and he was sixteen, mm -hmm. lied about his age, and was assistant to a doctor, and did a lot of um, went with the doctor right out on the field to bring boys in and mm -hmm. to help. So he went right into um, being a pharmacist and got his farm and got his degree, got his papers before we were married. He wouldn't mm -hmm. get married until we were, until he got them. And um, I didn't get the last name. Of what was his last name? McKenna. M-C-K-E-N-N-A. Mm -hmm. So he was, uh, he was in the field of helping people too. Yes. Wasn't yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, after, now when did he die? He died rather young, didn't he? Oh, 1945. 19, yeah, 1945. Mm -hmm. He was about in his 40s. He was 45. 45. <laughs> well, um, he was born 1900. Um, and you were left with the three youngsters to, to. Yeah. Uh, yes, but they, the girls were in. This was when we left the par. See, my son was born in the parsonage, mm -hmm. and um, in the little town uh, north of Port Huron, we were. He was up there. We were up there for only three years, and mm -hmm. that was the one place where we, were, where we were three years, and came back down into Oakland County again, or just Oakland, north, uh, just north of Detroit, just mm -hmm. on the north side of Detroit, and we were, and so he was there the six years again, and then he was supposed to retire. My father was supposed to retire then, but he kept on till he was seventy nine. Is that right? Uh huh. He had they they give him small churches to go to but he could stay in this one town and go out to well, did they live did your mother and father live to be old uh, but, uh, uh, he was 79 and he died um, he quit in November of 79 when he was 79 and he was 80 in March and he died in June and your mother was she uh, and my mother was still living she lived to be 90 she did I, uh -huh, I came down uh, two years after he died, I came back from Alaska and took her up there with me. Now, your second marriage was to an Ash County man. Right. Uh, uh, what was his name? Edwin Neal Foster. Edwin Neal Foster. Before, I, I, I don't believe I got your children's names. What are your children's names? Uh, Janet, Elizabeth, and Robert Patrick. Robert Patrick. Uh, so, and when, now, tell me a little bit about... Uh, uh, you're in Mr. Foster. How do you, where did you meet Mr. Foster? Well, my husband died in February, and I went to Roanoke the end of May, the end of April, 
to see if I could get a job. I'd been working as a secretary. Now you went from uh, where, Michigan? From Michigan. Uh -huh. To Roanoke? To Roanoke. What attracted you to Roanoke, Virginia? Uh, we had, my husband and I had been down through that country and had thought that we would like to settle in Richmond. Mm -hmm. So I started out for Richmond, but I got on a bus that went to Roanoke, and I thought, well, I'd, and it was uh, about midnight. I got off the bus there and went to a hotel. And the next morning I went to the um, employment agency and there was nothing, they didn't have anything around there, but they said they had a call for a secretary, anybody they could type at all, to go to Radford, or to go to Rhone, uh, Radford, Radford mm -hmm. to go to Radford. And um, so I didn't want to go. My daughter Janet had gone to Radford one year to college. And uh, she said, Mama, don't go to Radford now. You, you won't like it. And uh, she had really gone to uh, Lincoln Memorial is where she, that was a school up, in, up at uh, Cumberland Gap. Mm -hmm. You know, she went there. And uh, so I, Uh, it was a week or two before I finally made up my mind to go to Radford. And I went over to Radford and got the job right then and place to stay. Now, was that at the uh, powder plant? It was at the... the um, oh, there's a wartime. The, thing. Yes. Uh, there was um, a builder. Was They were building on to the powder plant. And they were... What I did was was interview the men who came to work there. Well, Edwin was already working in the powder plant. He'd been there. I don't know. I've forgotten how long now. He went there in 48, I believe. Oh, no. Let's see. This is 45. He came out of there in 48. Um, anyway, he'd, he'd been working there for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, a young woman that um, worked where, that lived where he was living, Mm -hmm. worked in the same office I did and she said oh I want you to meet this man from um, North Carolina she said um, um, I know you two would, would really hit it off and I said no thank you I'm just I was feeling so badly about my husband anyway that I just didn't, couldn't see it but I met him the 1st of September, that the last, no, it was the last Sunday in August of 1945. And we went along for two years. And then we went to uh, uh, the plant, or he, he had closed, what, in 47? And, uh, we went to, um, took a bus from, what did I say? From uh, Whitfield. 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 Took a bus Whitfield. from Whitfield to Chicago and saw my daughters, told them we were, uh, Basil Barr had written to him to come up there to Alaska to go on a sheep hunt. And um, so we each packed up a suitcase and uh, took a bus to Chicago and we stayed there overnight. My two daughters saw them and then we took another bus and traveled day and night to Seattle. And we went, he, we, he looked up the home of uh, Wallace. Mr. Wallace? Yes. Oh, well, what was his first name? I know it just as well. You mentioned a Tom earlier. No, Tom Wallace was here. This other one was um, Maybe it'll come back to me. Uh, and his wife was Bessie. And we stayed there for two or three days. And on the third day of July, 1947, Bessie went with us to the courthouse and witnessed our wedding. Is that right? And um, on the 4th of July, we got on a boat for Alaska. And that was a wonderful boat trip. Honeymoon, wasn't it? Yes. 
Well, it was five, took five days to go up to Seward, and then we had... Up to where? Seward, Alaska, mm -hmm. and then we took the train from Seward to Anchorage, and from Anchorage, which was nothing, it was just a little four corners with a depot and a hotel. And the hotel has expanded into a great big hotel, and of course, that right. town has really expanded, but not, to, it didn't really expand until about 19... Um, let's see what I think. i got to think about that. That was 47, and it was about 1960 when Anchorage began to... Boom. Expand. Boom. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. We got to, got to Fairbanks, a town of 700 log cabins, and uh, Bazabar just about fell off his chair when... Ed mm -hmm. said, this is my partner. <laughs> and, uh, but he found, he had, a ro he had a room already for Edwin, and he said, I've got to change it. I've got to find a, a double room. <laughs> 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 so he found a double room for us in the barracks, and, and Edwin went to work. So you stayed in Alaska. Alaska? Stayed in Alaska 16 years. 16 years. And that was uh, long before Alaska has become so developed, wasn't it? Yes, we were able to vote for statehood. Is that right? Uh -huh. Well, now you tell me one time about the snows you had in Alaska, and uh, I think I asked you something about educating the children, and you said uh, that maybe out in the bush they had to leave the home and come into the school area to stay. Or well, um, no, they really they had people go out to the villages. Oh, and they stayed. They were like missionaries in a way, and teachers and mm -hmm. preachers and teachers. Mm -hmm. And um, if you read any of those Alaska books about some of those people, they really had some experiences more than I had really. Mm -hmm. Snow got pretty deep. Didn't yes, it? the snow did get deep, but it was it around Fairbanks. There wasn't a wind. Anchorage has a strong wind and some of the other places that just about blows you off the earth. But um, uh, Fairbanks was down in the valley, only 4,000 feet um, elevation, where these other elevations, you know, are 13, 14,000 feet right around us. And uh, the gold mining had just about stopped. It still is a little bit, but not much up there. But uh, at that time, the gold mine, and they were just building the road. They hadn't quite finished the road through Canada across to uh, Fairbanks. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was finished in another year or two while we were there. Do you enjoy the cold weather, or did you enjoy yes. the cold weather? Yes, it was very, we, we dressed for it. Inside, you were very warm. Uh, things were well insulated. I learned all about insulating floors and walls and ceilings, and um, things became a little more um, advanced. Companies that um, were building new things to try out on people brought them to Alaska to, to try out. And maybe some things we got a little cheaper than other people did right at first, like insulation mm -hmm. and, and uh, things like that. But the uh, outdoors, you dressed with furs, as a rule. And the temperature w would drop down. I could always tell if I was outdoors walking. Um, um, walk from the, when I, after I started the shop in, in 49, why in 1950 I moved us out, out of town. And I had to take a bus and walk a quarter of a mile from the bus to the house. And if my knees began to feel cold when I was walking down the road, I knew that the temperature was dropping below 12, below zero. Is that right? And if it dropped like that, I knew it was going to be cold the next morning. And very likely, a look at the, we had the thermometer that w gave indoors and outdoor temperatures. And many a time I'd wake up the next morning and that outdoor temperature was 60 below and it would drop to 65, 67 and stay there for two or three days and it would come back up to, oh, if it came up to um, zero, 
we just throw off our hoods and it was wonderful weather. <laughs> My. Yes, really, just, right? just lovely. Uh -huh. And of course we didn't have daylight in the, from um, the end of September. We didn't have very much daylight until into February, the first, second week of February. Well, uh, what did you, did your lifestyle go on as usual? Uh, just use the electricity, use the lights? Oh, yes, we had lights and we had, we had <coughs> plenty, everybody had plenty of heat for inside. Mm -hmm. We had oil, we had oil stoves and in town they had uh, a steam system all through the town of Fairbanks and everybody was connected up to it. So people had steam heat in their houses in Fairbanks. Is that right? Well, mm -hmm. For and the 700 homes, did you say? Uh, the, well, they, those 700 homes were all torn down or burned down by the time I left in, in 1963. You saw a lot of changes there in yes, the 16 yes. years, didn't you? Saw big buildings built. That the, the biggest building when we went there was the post office. And on the top, it was a two-story, three, almost a two-and-a-half-story building, big building, near the river. And it had the uh, courthouse was on the second floor, and the post office in the on the first in the basement. I don't know what they did in the basement. It was offices, I guess. Yeah, it was offices. And that was the largest building in the town when we went there. Well. Uh, uh and there was a hospital. A hospital. Mm -hmm. what, this, what was your social life like? Did you have, uh, uh, well, was it pretty much the same as it would have been anywhere else? Well, in a way, the, um, the um, Masons were very strong, and this Eastern Star, and I was in, although I couldn't join the Eastern Star because I had nobody that was a Mason, Still, I was always invited when they had guests, and I was always invited to sing. So um, um, I went to things in the wintertime, different things like that. And um, they really dressed. The, the women all had beautiful evening clothes. The men, too. That was the one, <laughs> the one thing, because in the daytime you just... You just yes. totally covered <laughs> the first people, <laughs> and in inside though you dressed like you do anywhere because uh, when you were in offices or wherever you were, um, you dressed in ordinary clothes because the buildings were all well heated. Mm -hmm. Now uh, it was in Alaska. You opened a shop of needle craft, mm -hmm. needle art. Um, yes, I I started the knit and pearl shop. On on uh, February fifteenth, I opened it on February fifteenth, nineteen forty nine, and I told people I couldn't crochet. I just had, I just only had a few hundred dollars of knitting yarns that I'd sent to a company and told them to send me a few just to to see. And of course, I got back color cards and and I wanted to buy everything they had naturally. Then women would ask me if I had knit crocheting. Oh, anybody that crochets knows what knit crocheting is. And it was a fairly good cotton yarn thread at that time, but it, it has deteriorated. It is not good anymore. But I, the year I started, the DMC threads with which I had been brought up, now this is cotton thread that the French people make, and it had, at that time, that French company had been in business making cotton threads, embroidery and crochet threads, for over 200 years. I think it was 235 at that time. But it was off the market during the war. So it came back on the market of July of 1949. And I immediately wrote an